time developing a message. And kind of the metric for that that you're taught in Bible college and seminary is for every minute you're in front of people, you should spend an hour in study. So a 30-minute sermon, you should have 30 hours worth of study. And it takes a lot uh, to put a message together that is, that, that is this, this true to the word. That's what you want to do is you want to stay true to the word. So he, he, he's redeemed those hours to get beside our staff to shore up leadership out in Plant City, to launch that campus, to, to build up leadership here of, of those that are coming or those that are going to Plant City to replace those that are going to Plant City here in Tampa. It's been really good, and he's, he's cranking away at it. He's still around. He'll be in the lobby afterwards. Um, so uh, I, I just want to say thank you. We love you. You're awesome pastors, and we thank you for, do, for taking care of us. I also want to introduce you to some special people in my life, my family. So if you'll take a look on the uh, upper, yesterday I got it wrong because I'm facing y'all, so upper, wait, left, there we go, upper left, that's my, that's my baby girl and her husband, Cole Reichert, Savannah Reichert, and baby John Michael, my, my first G-baby, and we got another G-baby on the way, so I got old quick, but... <laughs> And, of course, on the other side, you, you know that ugly mug I'm standing in front of you right now, but that beautiful woman beside me is my wife, Dawn. I couldn't do anything that I do without her. And on the left bottom is my son, Ridge, and uh, he's interning in ministry, doing great things. And my, my other son, Joshua, my oldest son, Joshua, he's, doing, he's interning learning how to build uh, custom homes, which was our family business before I got in ministry, which is really cool. They all love Jesus and are serving God, so I, I love my family. They're awesome. <clears throat> before I jump in my message, though, I want to I pray uh, for the families who have lost loved ones in the last two days. There's been two mass shootings, if you didn't know. One, uh, 20 people were killed. The other one last night. Another nine people were killed last night. Um, uh, but we're going we're gonna to pray for those families, and then I'm going to proclaim something in the atmosphere, into the heavens over this church and this region, because we have the power to st stay the hand of the enemy. And we can say it's people, but it's really, it's really not people. It's, it's spiritual, I promise you. Um, but, so let's pray for them right now. Lord, I thank you I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're a comforter. And all those families who lost family members in the last couple of days, Lord, in these tragic things, I ask that you would, you would comfort them. You would give them peace. You would give them some closure. God, that you would, you would visit them and you would comfort them. And you would draw them to yourself, God, and, and let them feel your arms around them as they grieve the loss of loved ones. And and, Lord, we ask that you would send Christians alongside them to, to stand with them and to pray with them and to, to, to help get them through this tough time in Jesus' name. And, Lord, I proclaim right now over the heavens, over this church and all of our properties in South Shore, Plant City, Tampa, and, and the future properties and the staff and the people of this church and this region and this state, I declare your word over us now that the declaration of the Lord is I will be a wall of fire around it and I will be the glory within it. Lord, so be a wall of fire around us that burns up everything the enemy would try to bring at us and be the glory within us that rises up and, tra and transforms forms us from within in Jesus' name. I also proclaim your word. It says, arise, O Lord, and deliver me, my God. Strike my enemies on the jaw and break the teeth of the wicked. I declare right now into the heavens, the threatening of the enemy will stop in this, in this region in Jesus' name. We bind away every attack of the enemy in the name of Jesus, from every church in this region and throughout the United States, Lord, you put your angels around them. The angel of the Lord encamps around about them and delivers us from all harm. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Uh, let's give him a praise for it. He's awesome. <clears throat> so today I'm going to be talking about the Great Commission. But as I started talking about or studying about the Great Commission, I found out that the Great Commission has become, in Christianity in America, it's become the great omission because we've omitted it from what we do. 
And it was the last thing that Jesus ever said on the earth. And some of you may not know what the Great Commission is. I'm going to read it to you in just a minute. But it's the last thing Jesus said to his people on earth before he went to heaven. He, said, he told his disciples and all the ones that were following him, he gave them the, what we call the Great Commission. He didn't say, hey, I'm about to give you a Great Commission. He didn't say that. But he gave it to us anyway. And, you know, if, if someone knows they're leaving your presence and never coming back and you got to carry on the work even though they're gone, I think the last words are going to be kind of important, don't you? Think so? So let's read it real quick. Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Now, this is the Great Commission. So basically what the Great Commission is is going and making disciples. So how would you make a disciple? Now, I know some of you are already like, oh, my God, he's going to tell me to go witness to somebody behind a cash register. No, I'm not. But if Jesus tells you to do it, do it. But if, I'm not going to tell you to do it because um, sometimes, most, a lot of times that don't work, but sometimes it does work. You just got to listen to the Lord. But first, if you're going to, if you're going to make a disciple, the, a disciple first has to have a salvation experience, a, an experience where they give their life to Christ and they get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He gives us a formula here. And then is taught how to follow Jesus by someone and walks with the Lord because he's with us even through the end of the age. He's with us because the Holy Spirit is with us, the third person of the Trinity who is known as our helper, walks with us every day and can advise us in every situation that we get into. So that is what a disciple is. But um, there, I, I want to let you know there's a difference in a Christian and a disciple. There's a difference. Because in America, we can say we're Christian um, but, and not be a disciple. Let me give you a, a, a case in point. Um, I'm from the real south, which is, you know, you got to go north to get south. You got to go back to Georgia before you can. Florida's not south. I'm sorry. Plant City, I'm sorry. It's not south. I know it might make you mad. I love you anyway, but you got to go to Georgia to get south. So I'm from the real south. <laughs> so in the real south, everybody's saved. At least they'll tell you that. I had a good friend who was, a, who was in organized crime, sold guns, meth, and all this other stuff. But when I would talk to him, he'd be like, yeah, me and Jesus, we're good. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you're, you're, you're selling meth, man. People are dying from the stuff you do, man. And, but he, he, he thought because he, went, he walked down an aisle one time, oh, I'm good. You know, but no, no. Somebody, he called himself Christian. And I, had a lot of, I can take you to a bunch of friends I have that say the same thing, and they, they don't live like, they're, they're not followers of Jesus, but they're Christian. So let's just throw, throw that Christian thing aside, and let's just talk about being followers of Jesus, which is a disciple. So let me, let me I want to remove disciple and make it even easier. So let's say a disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ who is helping someone else become a follower of Jesus Christ. That's all it is. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm helping someone else become a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, why do I think the great commission has become the great omission? I'm going to give you some proof right here. So 73% of Americans claim to be Christian. There we go again. So 73% say they're Christian. Only 31% come to church. So only 31% have any kind of activity that says they're a Christian. So there's a big percentage there that say they're Christian, but they never even come to church. And of those that come to church, the average church attender comes 1.4 times a month. Now, I'm not sure how you get that point four. I guess you just roll on the parking lot and turn around and leave. <laughs> I, mean, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's the point four, but... I, the average church attender only comes 1.4 times. And uh, so of those 31%, 39% of them, uh, of born-again believers, think that you should share your faith. So what that really breaks down to is 12 people out of every 100 people who go to church and say they are born again actually believe that we should share our faith. 12 out of every 100 so you could break that down to like 1.2 out of every 10. I, the point two, I guess it's a little person. I guess that's how you do it. You know, but little people, they'll share their faith. They don't care. They're like, God set me free of a demon. And parents are like, ah, ah! Scares them. 
But 65% of millennials, which I thought millennials were still kids until I did this research, and I found out millennials are actually 24 to 39, which means I'm really old, um, <laughs> which I'm not happy with, but that's okay. <laughs> it's better than the alternative. But, um, so 65% of them believe it is offensive to share your faith. But yet we have Jesus telling us, go and make disciples. So how are we going to do that if only 12 out of every 100 believe that we should share our faith? Well, we just have to change something. And I'm not here to indict anybody, but, you know, sometimes you're, you, might have, you might have a problem and not realize you have a problem until somebody comes along and says, dang, that's a problem. Let's uncover that thing so we can get it fixed. And that's what I'm here to do today is help us in this church. Now, we may not can help the church in, in the entire America, but we can help this church, and we can get this right. Can't we, Crossing? All right. We're going to get it right today. All right. So when people receive Jesus, I'm going to give you some more stats, and that's a lot of stats, but just stick with me. 46% of people receive Jesus before the age of 13. These are, these are people who will ever receive Jesus. Receive Jesus before the age of 13, 46%. 22% received Jesus from ages 14 to 17. 8% received Jesus from ages 18 to 39. 4% from 40 to 64. And 1% over 64. Because if you live over 64, you already got Jesus because that's the only reason you're still alive. So <laughs> if you want to live long, just give your life to Jesus. <laughs> so 68% of people... Receive Christ before the age of 17. 68%, nearly 70% of all people who will receive Jesus receive him before the age of 17. So how many parents in this room have kids uh, younger than 17 or 17 or younger? Let me see your hands. 17, that's good, that's good, that's good. All right. All right, so parents, I want to talk to you for a minute. And even if they're older, I still want to talk to you. And if they're living in your house, it don't matter if they're 35 living in your house. You can still have something to say in their life. But, so first of all, the, our first disciples should be our children. They're, they're the ones that God gave us. They, he put them in our home for us to disciple. The Bible says to train up a child in the way he should go that when, when he's old, he won't depart from it, he or she, either one. So we're supposed to train them, but culture will tell us that we can't do that, that it's wrong of us to, to, to uh, they call it, uh, warp our children into believing in Christianity, um, and it was, we should just let them make their own choice. Well, that's a lie from hell because it's the spirit of this age, which is the spirit of Antichrist, that is telling us that. And we get inundated with it as Christians, and we begin to bow down to the pressure of it. But I want to I I I I encourage you today, it's time to take a stand and say enough is enough. You can't have my kids. I don't care how hard you push on them. I don't care how hard you pull on them. You can't have them. And we have to, as parents, get involved. So first thing I want to encourage you is in discipling your children is know what they're doing. Know what they're doing. Know what's going on in their life. Know who their friends are. And if you don't approve their friends or their friends are taking them down a the wrong path, remove them from those friends. Figure out how to do it. Give them an option to do it. But if they don't do it, figure out how to do it. You know, I used to do what I would call walk-bys. I would wait till they got on their phone and open it up, and I'd walk by and just snatch it. <laughs> Start going through the stuff. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times my kids got put on restriction from a walk-by. <laughs> because we had all the passwords to all their stuff, all the accounts we knew about. We found out later on there was some we didn't know about. But, you know, kids do that. Kids are kids. But you got to know everything you need to know. But Jesus will end up telling on them somehow. He'll, he'll get them. He'll get them. They'll show up in a friend, a friend request, and they'll be like, I thought I had his account. It's a different account. Yeah, Jesus tell them. So the second thing is have time to sit with your kids and sit with your family and talk about the things of God, whether that's a structured devotion time. If that works for your family, that's great. What worked for me and my family is we ate dinner around the dinner table at least four nights a week, at least four nights a week. And we didn't just eat dinner. We talked about what went on in our day and what was going on at, at, with them at school and in their classes. And we talked about everything. And, and, 
And, and so we would sit around that table sometimes two, three, four hours, and we would talk about issues they're dealing with, and we would introduce the Word to them and teach them the Word of God, and this is how we act as Christians, and this is, this is, uh, this is who we are as all days. This is what we do, and, and we're not that. We're not doing that. Well, well, Johnny can do it. Well, Johnny ain't mine, so you, you're mine, and you're going to do what I say do. So this is how we live. I can't help how Johnny lives. Because I don't know what's going on with Johnny's mama or daddy. I don't, know what, I don't know what's going on over there. But I know how we live. And this is who we are. But we would have those conversations around the table. And guess what? My, my kids, our kids didn't always like us. And that's okay. That's okay because they love us and they'll come back around. It's okay for them to be mad at me for a little while for taking something from them that's hurting them. And I encourage you, get involved in their life. Have time you can impart into their life. However that works for you. You know, make them come to church. Let me say that again. Make them come to church. Sometimes, we, so, so if we have a student ministry, if we, you have a middle schooler, make them go to our student ministry. I know some middle schoolers right now looking at me mean, mad, because you're supposed to be over there right now. You need to put them around pastors and leaders who are there to help them grow in the Lord. Because when they hit those teenage years and those hormones start acting up, they lose their minds. I don't know what happens. There's a chemical lobotomy that happens around age 13. And I guess they get it back when they hit their 20s. I'm still waiting on some. <laughs> and during those times, you got to take your kids and you got to hold them in. You're going to church. You're, you're going to stay in church. You know, and when they got to high school and could drive and had their own vehicles and, and they, they, they would be like, oh, we don't, I don't want to go. I got to drive all the way over there. I don't want to go. I don't want to go on Wednesday night. If you have a high schooler, you need to hold them jokers in on Wednesday night because they'll come to a service and, they'll, and get them in a life group with other kids that are struggling with the same things. And they'll, they'll say the same old thing is, oh, I don't know anybody. Oh, they're weird. Well, you're weird. You're a teenager. Go, be around a bunch of weirdos, because you're weird. <laughs> but the truth is, we as parents, sometimes we, we give in to those, the, 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 the culture and the pressure that comes from our kids. Our, our kids push on us to not serve Christ unintentionally because they're in a secular system. And I could go all in about that system and how it tries to get our kids out of church and remove Judeo-Christian heritage from their life. And that pressure is pulling on them, so they push on us. Other parents will tell you, oh, if you make them go to church, they're going to hate the church. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I made my kids go to church all the time. When they said, I don't want to go to church, when they were crying because I made them go to church and whining about it. And, and you can't say say football or baseball or any of that stuff my boys played football and they would get out of practice in plant city at 6 45 and show up at the house like, it's, it's too late i don't want to go i'm like no you're going get a shower get in the truck go and they might get here late but they still got here and they're serving god today now they they may not have been at that time and they made some bad they made mistakes they we all do but i held them in and sometimes it's, you know i mean you ever try to wash a cat you know, sometimes you got to hold that joker in there. <laughs> they don't want to stay under that water. Sometimes you got to just hold them in until all that dirt gets off of them. You got to do that with kids. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, parents, <laughs> kids are our, our kids are our most important ones to disciple. And, and, I'm glad you clapped for that. But if we, if we only come to church 1.4 times a month, that sends a message, church isn't important. It sends a big message, church is not important. It's not as important as me fishing. It's not as important as me going to the beach. It's not as important as me going to a, some other recreation thing or just laying in bed. It's not as important. It sends a message. It's time for us to wake up. A disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ who is helping someone else to become a follower. How to become a follower, I'm going to walk you through this. It's really easy. It's really easy. There's three things that you have to have to be a follower of Jesus Christ. One is a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the way you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit is you've had a salvation experience. You've given your life to Christ. You've said the prayer. You've committed your life to Jesus. You've been baptized. 
and you have a daily devotion where you're, you're worshiping, you're praying, you're in the word, and, and, and the Lord is speaking to you throughout your day and leading you in situations that you're in. It would look something like this, that if I, I, I'm, I'm doing all those things and I'm, I'm, in a, in, in, I'm at work and I have a decision that needs to be made and I ask the Lord for help and I, I feel better about one decision than I do the other, then that's, that's probably God leading me in that direction. It's, it, there's, it's subtle movements, but it's still the Holy Spirit leading us. And he is known as our helper who is beside us to help us with everything. So first is a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Secondly is a relationship with your church. You need to be serving somewhere in your church. Serving. Now, it's great if you serve out in the community. It's great if you serve at, you know, feeding the homeless. That's great. That's great. But you need a relationship with your church. You need to be serving in your church. You need to be giving in your church. You need to be serving other people, pouring out into someone else's life as a life group leader, as a, as a youth leader, as a, um, you know, uh, uh, whatever. You know, having one of these Ask Me shirts on up here, praying for people, out there welcoming people, bringing people in as you're parking them, whatever. You need to be serving somewhere in your church. We need to be, that's, that's, that's having a relationship with the church. So a relationship with the Holy Spirit, a relationship with your church. And, and also in a relationship with your church, we are givers. So when Pastor Greg says God has directed us to build a campus and we're giving toward that, then we give. Not if we should give, but how much should we give? Because we're bought in and we have a relationship with the church and God has put us here to bring the vision to pass. And that's how we change communities. The reason we're putting a, a, a campus over in Plant City is not just so we can say we have three campuses. We're putting a campus in Plant City because there are people that need to be reached in Plant City that, that some of the churches over there aren't reaching yet. And we're there to reach the ones that God called us to reach. Truthfully, there's enough people over there that could pack out every church in that area and we wouldn't have room for them anywhere. But we're going because God has told us to go over there to transform that culture by the power of Jesus Christ. Because I want you to look around at the diversity in this room. This is what heaven looks like. But the sad thing about it is a lot of churches don't look like this. And we do, but we do, and we're taking that there because God called us to go transform a region, and, and that's why we do it. We do it with campuses, and we do outreaches from that campus and bring people in just like we do here. The next thing is you need a relationship with other believers. So a relationship with the Holy Spirit, a relationship with your church, and a relationship with other believers. Those are the three things that make you a follower. And how can you develop a relationship with other believers? Get in a life group. Here's, here's how you do it right here. Get in a life group. Text that word, lead, host, or join, to that number, and, and you'll be signed up for a life group. I encourage, don't leave today without signing up for a life group. If you're not in a life group, you're not doing life with other believers. And the truth is, you can't even live out the word of God unless you are doing life with other people. Because you can't, you can't love someone, and part of love is long-suffering. So you can't suffer long with somebody unless you're involved in their life. So to live out the gospel, we have to be involved in other people's lives. Don't leave today without signing up for a, for a, a, a life group because you're not too busy. I promise you. And I, I hear it, I hear it, I hear it. But I know people who travel all the time for work. I know people who are in and out of town, busy people. I know a lot of busy people. But the truth is we have time for what we want to do. We have time to go fishing. We have time to go to a movie. We have time to watch TV. We have time to play Fortnite, young'uns, and some of you older ones. I play too. I'm terrible at it. But anyway, we have time for what we want to do, and we make time for what's important to us. So that's how you become a follower. So sign up to be in a life group today. Remember, a, a disciple is just a follower of Jesus Christ who is helping someone else to become a follower of Jesus Christ. So how do we help others? Now, I'm going I'm to go through here, and I'm going to give some common fears of why we, we don't help other people um, become followers of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to kind of try to dispel some of these fears and some of these reasons. So the first one is fear. I mean, that's the bottom line of it. It's the number one weapon of the enemy to keep us bound up. 
if, if you want to do something for Jesus or you feel like God is telling you to do something and you don't do it, you have allowed fear to reduce who God called you to be. If caution gets in the way of what God said, you've allowed fear to reduce who God called you to be. But in 2 Timothy 1.7, the Bible says, For God did not give us a spirit of fearfulness, but of power, of love, and of sound judgment. So anything that gets in the way of power, love, and sound judgment is fear. God has called us to be courageous in a time that there's fearful things going on everywhere. People are, people are being hurt and pushed on and ridiculed. Culture, a, a small 3% of culture is, in America is, telling, is driving the bus of culture in America. 3% of the population is driving the bus of culture in America. And we are just sitting back going like, okay, okay. I won't say that anymore. I won't say that's wrong anymore. I won't do that. When 63, 73% of us are supposed to be believers that stand for something. But God has called us to be courageous in times of, of fear. Courage means strength in the face of pain or grief. Strength in the face of adversity. It doesn't mean the feeling of fear is gone. It just means when it comes, you stand up to it. And you push through it. Because that's, that's what courage is. Courage isn't a freedom from fear. It's not. It's, you're going you're gonna to do what you're called to do no matter if fear comes or not. Because fear will come. And the truth is, unless you're a little fearful, <laughs> you're not really stepping out there in faith. These mess... Uh, 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 in Proverbs 28, 1, it says, The wicked flee, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as lion. I, I was reading this next scripture the other day, uh, reading the, the Bible, and it, this was in my reading, and it, and, it, and, it, and it messed me up for a minute. I had to really uh, talk to Jesus about it because it got to me. I, I was wondering why this was, ha why this was in here. So in Revelation, which is the end of the book, chapter 21, it gives a list of things that, that those who are victorious will get. And he goes to say in verse 7, the victor will inherit all these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son, the victor. Then he gives another list. He said, but the cowards, the unbelievers, vile, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, theirs, theirs will be the lake of burning, burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, I, when I read that, I was like, okay, okay, Lord, I get, I get murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters. I get liars. I can't stand when people lie to me. That's one of my biggest things. I can't stand it. I get that. But cowards? Just because somebody was scared? And then, then I flat, that, the scripture dropped in my mind from the parable of the talents where he gave one five talents, one two talents, and one one talent. The one with five went out and made five more. The one with two went out and made two more. He called them faithful and well done and gave them more to be over. And the one who had one took it and hid it. And he brought it back to him and said, because I was scared, I, I, I put it in the ground. Here it is back to you. And God called him a wicked and lazy servant and said, cast him into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I, I don't know, culture says it's not a hell, but uh, a lake of fire and sulfur, I mean, that sounds like hell to me. It may not be, that may not be the name of the city, you know, hell, this is hell. It may not be that, but it's sulfur and it's fire. I don't want any part of it. Or weeping and gnashing of teeth, I don't want any part of that either. So we, ha we have to be courageous because God understands. It's not a, he's not indicting us. He's just warning us. He's telling us that fear is just a trick of the enemy to keep us from becoming who he called us to be. So let's not give in to fear. We have authority over it. All right, so the next, the next reason is I don't know enough. I don't know enough. Well, let me tell you about my first experience of leading somebody to Jesus. I had been... Never been in church. I was 23. I was, I was dating this girl. Her friends were partying with my friends. We was in the bars all the time. We was just, you know, doing what the world, people in the world do, just being crazy. And so we, our, our relationship was kind of based in crazy and <laughs> in bars and all that kind of stuff. So I got saved, 
And I, I went to college with her. I met her in college, and I got saved. And, and then I, I, I was like, well, this is probably over because I got saved, and she crazy. Just like I'm cra- I was crazy. I was crazy yesterday. I ain't crazy today. I was still crazy, by the way. I just needed to get cleaned up. <laughs> But so I went back and I told her, I was like, I gave my life to the Lord. I'm not going to be doing that anymore because I knew the, the one thing, the one, you know, the partying was wrong. So that one thing I'm never going to do again. That's all I knew was wrong. I didn't, I didn't even know what sin was after. I mean, I, I really didn't. But God saved me from the drugs and the alcohol. And I, so I quit doing it. I was addicted. I was hurting. And, and all I did, and she didn't kick me to the curb, which is what I expected, so we just kept hanging out, and we were in study groups together, and we'd have lunch together. We'd talk on the phone together. We still hung out, um, and, and, and I would just share what God was doing in my life. I, 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 never, I, never, asked, I never pushed on her to, to say a salvation prayer. I never, I never preached to her or said, you need to get your life right. I never did any of that. I just shared this, man. God's changing my life. I went to church today and this happened and God said this to me and I, this is happening in my life. And after about a month, I invited her to come to church with me. Well, she got saved. And then I married her. <laughs> now I got to say, me and her both, neither one of us realized that until two days ago when I put this together. I was like, dang, that's the first person I led to Jesus. I married her. Now, I don't recommend going out and finding somebody wild and saying, I'm going to date them and then get them saved so I can marry them. I don't recommend that. <laughs> Evangelism dating doesn't always work. <laughs> you usually end up going the other way, but God worked it out for us. Thank God. After what, it's 26 years now? All right, come on, come on. (laughs) So you don't have to know anything because I didn't. (laughs) I knew nothing. I just knew Jesus was doing something in my life, and I shared it with people. I shared it with her, and I shared it with other people I knew, and and, and God did something through that. So just just throw that away. I encourage you to learn. We need to do that. But the next one is I'm concerned about being offensive. Now, I want to help you not be offensive, okay? When I first started witnessing, I was pretty offensive because I just, I felt like I needed to control the person. I needed to get them saved because it was another notch in my, in my, in my spiritual belt. It was, you know, another notch on my ring. It was one more to the kingdom. It was all about me winning. It was what it was about. And it was out of fear because I didn't feel like I was good enough unless I won somebody to the Lord. Well, all those days of preaching to people and beating people over the head with the Bible, I, 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 don't, I don't think, I can't say that I saw one get saved because it don't work like that. Because what I was doing, I was trying to control others. And I was trying to control the outcome when all God called me to do was to love them. Whenever I try to control someone else and, and, and get them to do some kind of behavior modification, That's me trying to control them. That's not me loving them. Control comes out of fear, I promise you, and there's a lot to learn out of that. If you're a control freak, you got a lot of fear, and I speak from experience. But love is based out of faith because if I can just tell somebody how good God is to me and how much he loves them, I can can love on them, I can be kind to them wherever they are. It don't even matter. Well, I got all this in my life. It don't even matter. None of that matters. Jesus loves you still. And if you want to go with me, we can go. But if not, I'm not going to make you. So it's, it's all the motivation. Are you trying to control or you just want to love on somebody? Because the truth is, who wouldn't love some good news? Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't love some good news in, in the community? And the last thing is, I don't know how to do it. So I'm going to help you. It's easy. It should be natural. It should be organic. Should be something that happens every day. I'm not telling you to go out, stand on a preach cor- uh, uh, street corner, and preach. That's not that's that's impossible, and people aren't going to come to that. That's 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 almost impossible to win anybody. So it should be natural and organic with people you already know. People you already know. People you work with. People you work out with. People you may play sports with. People you you know people you you do stuff with. People you know. Family that's not saved, people you are, that are already in your life, natural, organic, that are already there. Somebody you work with every day is the perfect person 
to make a follower of Jesus Christ. And the next thing you do, after, you know, it, natural interactions and you get to know them a little bit and you're able to share what God's doing in your life, you know, you, you can invite them to church. We have these little cards. They're called Invest and Invite Cards. So we're, you're going to get one of these when you walk, walk out, out of the doors today. You're going to get one of these. And I want you to take it with you. And I want you to ask the Lord. We're going to do this in a minute. You're, you're going to ask God, who do I need to invest and invite in? You don't have to do the work. Just invite them to church. Invite them to be a part of your life. Say, hey, man, I, I, go, to, I, go, to this, I go to the 1030 service. I want you to come to service with me. Meet me in the lobby, and we'll go to lunch afterwards. Bring your family. We'll all go hang out afterwards and go to lunch, and we'll get to know each other a little better. Come on out and join me. Everybody wants friends. Everybody wants friends. I would ask you to raise your hands, but, you, you, I, you know, I already sprung the trap, so I can't trap you in it. But we all want friends, don't we? I do. I like people. Some hermits may be like, I don't want no friends. Well, okay, but you need a friend. <laughs> but invite them to church. Or you can pray for them. Everybody needs prayer. And all you have to do is ask them, what do you need prayer for? That's all we have to do is ask. Can I pray for you? And that's not offensive at all. So if you feel quickened by the Holy Spirit, ask them. If they won't come to church with you, bring them to your life group. See, here's another important reason of being in a life group. If you're a married couple and you're in a life group and you're doing life with other married couples, God is going to change your life. And when God changes your life, you'll be with people on a daily basis who are struggling in their marriages. And you can say, you know what? I have a life group. This is all about marriages. So why don't you and your wife come? And we, you, know, we'll just, we, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to tell them what's going on. Just come be a part of it. And this is how it's changed my life. Who wouldn't want that? Everybody wants that. Invest and invite. You're getting one of these cars today, and it's not a one-time thing. It's a lifestyle thing. It's the great commission. It's what God called us to do. Not just the ones on a platform. Not just the ones wearing red shirts. But every believer is called to this. Every one of us. So, my challenge today for followers, I want you to think of somebody right now. Think of them. Get their name in your mind of who you can, who you can invite. I had somebody come up to me last night in the lobby, and he said, I don't have to get, I didn't have to think about it long because they're in my house. <laughs> my relatives that came from out of town, and they need Jesus. Now they're in my house. I know where they are. So he had a plan to go home and talk to them, which is great. So think of someone. Think of someone. The ne next thing is ask God, what is my next step? What's the next thing I need to do to reach that person? And he'll give you something. It might be a thought, and you might think it's your thought. That's great. Whatever. It doesn't even matter. Just get a next step and take it. And then get them in your life. Sometimes we just need to build bridges back. If God speaks to you about a, an old friend or an old, a family member that you may have, you and them may not be seeing eye to eye or you may not have talked for years, family members are sometimes some of the most strained relationships for whatever reason. A cousin you, did, you, you had a falling out with that you haven't talked to in years and you're like, well, I'm not calling them, so they call me. Well, Jesus said we're supposed to be bigger than that. We're the ones that are supposed to be taking the wrong and reaching out and helping others. Let's forgive and let's rebuild some bridges today. A brother or a sister you got wronged by that need Jesus. Let's, let's, let's put all that petty stuff aside and build a bridge back into their life so that they can get saved. Let's build it. Let's do it. And then get them in church. Get them in church, just like we talked about other, no, earlier, is you need to be in church if you're a believer. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you need, to be, you need to be in church. You need to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You need to have a relationship with your church. Let's go after them. Let's go after them. Now, if you want to become a follower today, you may not be a follower. Maybe you were a Christian. <laughs> I ain't saying you were a meth dealer. I ain't saying that. I'm just saying <laughs> that was an extreme. 
<laughs> that was an extreme. But maybe you just were a Christian, a so-called Christian, because you come to church or you profess that, yeah, I believe in that faith and really don't, didn't know what you believed, but weren't a disciple, weren't a follower. And today you want to say, I want to become a follower, and I will become a follower. This is how you do it. First, you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We went through it already. A salvation experience. If you've not had a salvation experience and then been baptized, you need to do that today. You can't be baptized today. We have baptisms coming up. But you can give your life to Jesus today. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a minute. Get a devotion. Life. A daily prayer, worship, and reading of the Bible. Get a Bible. Get a journal. Start reading your Bible. Start writing in that journal what God says to you in your prayer time. Have a relationship with the church. Get involved in ministry. And have a relationship with other people, other believers. Get in a life group today. Today. Don't wait. Because this is, this is what happens when God speaks to us. We feel convicted and it's like, I need to do something. And then it, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. Well, tomorrow never comes. Tomorrow never gets here. And then it's five months down the road and we feel convicted again. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow never comes. And then we'll stand before him one day and we'll have to give an account for all of our actions. And he'll say, and you know, we may, might make it to heaven, but we still have to give an account for our actions. Well, I told you to do this or I told you to do that and I told you to do this and nothing, you, you didn't do anything with it. Why? I mean, these are scriptures I'm talking about. I'm not trying to scare anybody. But I'm, I'm, I'm giving you reality. This is reality. We will stand before the Lord one day to give an account for our lives. And not, that's, not, that's not determining whether we make heaven or hell, but it, it, it does stand for something. So today, we're going to pray this prayer right now. And some people are going to get saved. So I want everybody to just bow your heads real quick. We're going to pray this prayer out loud. Everybody pray it with me. Dear Jesus. I give you my life. I confess that Jesus is Lord of my life. And I believe that God raised him from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that was you, when I count, I'm going to count to three. And when I hit three, and if you prayed that prayer today to, to say, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I haven't been and I want to be. And I'm going to be. And you prayed that prayer of salvation just then. When I, hit, when I say three, I want you to lift your hand in the air and I want you to hold it up for just a minute so we can celebrate with you. We're not going to snatch you out of your seat. We're not going to embarrass you in any way. I promise you. That's why I had everybody bow their heads. I wanted to make it easy. So when I say three, shoot that hand up, keep it up. One, two, three. Got you, got you. Come on, come on. Got you. Yes, yes. Come on, there's more, there's more. They broke the ice. Today is the day. Today is the day. If you just raised your hand, you got a card. Please fill that card out and bring it to one of our prayer partners in a minute when we pray. So everybody, if you would stand now, we're gonna enter a time of worship and uh, service isn't over. So, so let's not, any movement at this point should be forward for prayer. If you need prayer for anything, please come forward. Our prayer partners are here to pray for you. And those of you who gave your life to Christ for the first time today, please come talk to a prayer partner and bring that card. And, Pat, and uh, Pastor Richard will be right back out with you.